We know He's merciful, but what about lifestyles? Is God tolerant? And now, Garner Ted Armstrong. Did you hear about the former head of the moral majority taking issue on the Hannity radio show about a statement made by apparently one of the spokespersons for the Democratic Party likening right-wing Christians or the moral majority to the Taliban? Well, one person took great umbrage at that, and I don't blame him a bit because I take umbrage at it too. After all, I believe in a very conservative, absolutely, believe it or not, and I'll prove it to you a little later as we go along, intolerant point of view involving many things going on in our society today. I've got a tape for you I think you need to get. Is God tolerant? Is Almighty God, the eternal Creator God, who gives you every breath of air you breathe, tolerant of sin? Does he like to coexist with the devil? Is he tolerant of AIDS, of homosexuality, of pornography, of gay rights movements, of all of the crimes, the assorted horrors that we hear today like mass murder and serial killers of what happened on 9-11, of terrorism, of chemical and biological and nuclear weapons, of the possibility of the use of weapons of mass destruction, and he just is tolerant. He wants you to be tolerant. The way the nihilists tell it, and I'll come back and tell you what that means in a minute because a lot of people might not know, we're just supposed to be tolerant of everything going on around us. Just live and let live. Let other people have whatever bizarre, weird religion or practice or bizarre, you know, whether it's eviscerating animals in satanic rituals or even perhaps children, for pity's sake, but be tolerant. You need to get that tape. Is God tolerant? Also, the booklet, here's the best news you could ever hear. You know, our news is every single day nothing but bad, bad, bad. There's a trial going on in Texas right now. A woman who murdered five little precious children, one after another. They're going to try to prove that she was crazy. Well, we know she's crazy, but I mean legally insane at the time. But she was allegedly suffering from, quote, postpartum depression. Seems to me like she would have suffered from that the first birth, wouldn't she? And then they made a second birth, and the third birth, and then the fourth. I've heard of a local call-in talk, call, uh, talk show, say in a minute, that mothers who had actually gone through terrible postpartum depression didn't even think about trying to kill their children. Are we supposed to be tolerant of that? Should the jury be tolerant of it? Should they say, well, the poor little kids, I mean, they just, you know, were noisy, and she had to change their dirty diapers, and for pity's sake. Every bit of the news we get today is bad. There are very, very seldom any good news. It's about time you heard some good news. And this is literally a booklet about the best news you could ever hear. And all you need to do to get it is to dial that number we'll show you, which is 903-561-7070. That's 903-561-7070. I'd like to send it to you free of charge, no price, as is the tape. Free of charge, no price, no bill to follow. No one ever asks you for any money at all. It's yours to do with as you will. How tolerant are you? For example, let me give you some statistics right quickly. Every year in the United States, there are approximately, and this is a very close figure, 1,500,000 abortions. That has been going on for decades, year after year after year. Tens of millions of potential Americans, more than a population of many a small nation in the world, have been just flushed down the stream. The whatever, whatever they do to uh, biological, you know, when they, well, I'm we'll going into that, but anyway. And we tolerate it, don't we? I don't. I do not tolerate it. I wouldn't tolerate it around me. I wouldn't tolerate it in my family. I wouldn't tolerate it among friends or acquaintances or associates. I won't tolerate it in the church of which I'm a president. What will I do about it? I will not bomb an abortion clinic. I will not murders a, a, a doctor who, you know, takes care of the abortions. But I would use whatever power I might have with regard to simple fellowship. I just say, no, if you're going to do that, young lady, if you're going to murder your child, then I'm sorry, you can have no further fellowship with this group. Now, that's my right. And that is the only way that I would have any, quote, power, end quote, over a decision anyone else would make. And they've got, of course, because we're an open arms, open door church, they've got the power and the ability to simply say, well, I'll go elsewhere. 
because there are a lot of churches that, of course, go along with that. Well, the people who want you and I to be tolerant actually label the Pope and Billy Graham as bigots. Anyone who believes in the Word of God as literal and believes in the laws of God called bigots. It is absolute bigotry. We are biased. We are bigots. Not only are there 1,500,000 little innocent unborn thrown away, ejected, thrown in the trash can every year, there are 950,000 people who die of heart disease, and many of them as a result of smoking. Now, I have to tolerate a certain amount of smoking, but a certain amount of smoking I don't have to tolerate. I can get up and move. I can ask someone, hey, could I hold the cigarette for you? Because you're getting none of it. I'm getting all of it. It's drifting my way. I can say something about that. And thankfully, laws have been passed. I know a lot of people, including one very famous talk show host, disagrees with that, where we should be able to sit around in a breakfast environment and having our scrambled eggs and stack of hotcakes or whatever and breathing his cigar smoke. Uh, I don't agree with that. I used to smoke for eight solid years, many, many years ago in the past. I know all about it. I know how many times I tried to quit and how, what a horrible struggle it was until I finally managed to quit that horrible habit in long since, I'm sure, because I quit in 1953. Uh, my lungs are probably pink at this point, but uh, be that as it may, some of my dearest friends, a very recent date, have lain in the hospital with the usual tubes and all of that, dying an agonizing death as a result of smoking, and they have emphysema, and there's just no cure for it in some cases. They just die. Cancer of the throat, cancer of the cheek and gums, cancer of the larynx or the esophagus or whatever, emphysema. Their lungs don't function anymore. But, you know, I'm tolerant in the sense that I don't go on a campaign when somebody lights up near me and say, hey, young man or lady or whatever, don't you know you're killing yourself? I mean, I preach that. I say that in the general public. And I even said to a dear friend of mine, I said, Sam, I don't want to come down there to the hospital for a month straight or six weeks straight and watch you die, and I sure do wish you'd quit that. But I said it gently, and I was, it was out of concern for him, and I, I wasn't making fun of him. I mean, I understand how hard it is for people to, to quit smoking. It didn't do any good, and he would make his resolutions. He'd try to quit. Well, on to the subject. You know, 950,000, almost a million people dying of emphysema and heart disease and so on every year, that, that's horrible. 530,000 die of assorted kinds of cancer, over a half million Americans. 44,000 die as a result of AIDS, and that is growing and skyrocketing, especially in Eastern Europe, in Russia, and all over Africa, and here in the United States, it's growing. 42,000 people die on our streets and highways, and you know about the Mothers Against Drunk Driving. 26,000 people die, usually in the home, from homicide. Now, do we tolerate all of this? Well, I guess we do because it happens all around us. I don't think we approve of it. You know, that's the difference that some of these people don't seem to see. They want to take approval and tolerate and put it together in the same basket and make you tolerant in the sense that you accept it. You live with it. You almost like it. No problem. God Almighty will never compromise with His law. And let me tell you what God says about His law. This is in Romans 6, 12 to 16. I'll just read you a scripture that's very important. Let not sin, therefore, rule or reign in your mortal body. You remember, now sin is the transgression of God's law, which means the Ten Commandments. That says, honor your father and your mother. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt do no murder, which is the original, not thou shalt not kill. And all of the laws, including thou shalt not covet, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not steal, etc., etc., thou shalt have no other gods before me, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. Anything that even remotely comes close to that as Christ himself lifted the Ten Commandments to a spiritual level that reaches into every conceivable human action or thought, every nuance of human behavior, is called sin in the Bible. It's a sin to lie. It's a sin to cheat. It's a sin to steal. Now, do you tolerate liars, cheaters, and, and people who thieve and, and steal? Well, you almost have to because they're everywhere around you. And every one of us at one time or another probably told some lies. 
Every one of us sin in some little way or another every single day. Does that mean because we are human, we have our appetites, we have our shortcomings, we make our mistakes, we stumble, trip, and fall, that we don't get up and go on and try again? Does it mean we live with it, we coexist with it? We say, well, I'm tolerant of this particular sin in my life. God will not save any individual He cannot govern, and Almighty God is absolutely 100% intolerant of sin. He's intolerant of sin. He goes on to say, verse 14, sin shall not have dominion over you. You know, most people don't look at it that way. They say, hey, I'll live my life. This is my choice. You don't tell me what to do. Kids about age 15, 16 always think their dad and mother, a bunch of old fogies, they're way out of date. Ah, dad, you know what's going on. Get with it. You're not even hip, man. The, the, the mother doesn't know. What are you going to do? You can try to live my life for me. I'll live my life the way I want to live my life. In the middle teens, a lot of kids decide they know an awful lot more than dad and mom. Of course, they don't even know a tiny little centillionth of a percent in a lot of ways, and probably don't even have any near the kind of ed education in front of them that their parents got, but that's what they think. And so they think, I'm going to live my life the way I want to. And they become rebellious toward their parents and rebellious toward law. This dumb little kid the other day that flew a Cessna 172 retractable into that great big bank building down in Tampa, I would have loved to have gotten a hold of that kid before he ever, I can't understand why he got into the airplane, why it was locked, why they even let the kid get down and get access to the airplane in the first place. But he decided that he'd become nationally famous and claim that he actually liked what bin Laden did to us on September 11th. So, uh, you know, you're tempted to want to interview the parents and uh, say, well, you know, what, what, what happened? And actually what happened was before he was five, but no one's going to be able to admit that, but that's exactly what it was. Sin shall not have dominion over you. Most people don't think of it that way. The average smoker, for example, this is a pen, but there's a little, little white cigarette. Let's pretend it's a little white cigarette. The average smoker does not say to this little white cigarette, you are my God. You are my boss. You are my ruler. You tell me when and how and where and what, and I say, yes, Lord, and I obey. They don't think of themselves as craven cowards crawling on the floor, begging, bawling, crying, oh, little white weed, where are you? I've got to have you. And that something has a hold of them, which is actually not, well, not too far from some of the other drugs because nicotine is a drug and it does create a tremendous dependency. It is a narcotic. You are hooked on it. And it isn't you mentally that want the cigarette. It's your capillaries and the tips of your fingers and your tips of your toes. It's your entire body because your entire system, your blood system, your blood supply is hooked upon it. And it's just like when you're real hungry and your stomach is growling and you, your stomach thinks your throat's been cut and you wonder when you're going to eat again. The body is just crying out to be satisfied with that kind of a flush and a rush. How well I remember it, the first cigarette in the early morning when I was in the aircraft carrier during the Korean War, before my feet ever hit the deck, I reached for my shirt and lit up a cigarette. And I know and I understand right down on the ground exactly what it is to smoke. Most people don't look at satisfying, inordinate, and actually sinful human appetites as a ruler over you as a dictator to whom you give obeisance, to whom you crawl around in subservience. You say, you are my Lord, you are my God, you are my ruler, I obey you, little white uh, cigarette. They don't think of that. God's Word says, sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. If you have been forgiven, God in His graciousness forgives you for breaking His law. He goes on to explain that. What then? Shall we sin? Shall we then go back and break God's law again? Because we're not under the law, meaning the penalty of the law, but under grace, God forbid, saying we should not go and sin once God has forgiven us. Know you not, verse 16, that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, like the little white weed I'm talking about, or any other human physical appetite that appeals to us that we obey, like a kleptomaniac, for example, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. One more scripture before I take a quick time out. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Those are two opposite, opposites. 
The wages of sin is not eternal life, but in a different place. The wages of sin is death. That's what we earn when we break God's law. That is an absolute. That is so absolute, it is like a stainless steel wall of one foot thickness. And every time you run up against it and bang your head against it, you don't even make a dent, except in your own skull. The more you bang your head against that steel wall, the more it hurts. And God's law is like that. It is absolutely ungiving, unresilient, but it is forgiving when you break it if you repent. And when we repent of breaking God's law, He will forgive us. But He says, don't do it again because it feels so good when you quit banging your head against that steel wall. I'll come right back. Our modern culture, reflected throughout the media, preaches tolerance. But are there any limits? And how tolerant is God? Call now for the free sermon tape entitled, Is God Tolerant? You'll also receive the best news you could ever hear. Both the booklet and this riveting sermon tape will be sent free if you call 903-561-7070. You know, these personal anarchists, these nihilists all around us who are in political parties and all these various special interest groups and people who just want, I guess, to, uh, for us to become a society like Sodom and Gomorrah, where we tolerate everything, anything and everything. We tolerate murder. You all know about the O.J. Simpson trial, for pity's sake. We all know, at least I do, to my satisfaction. I mean, the evidence was just so preponderant and so overwhelming. I didn't have a doubt in my mind once I heard all the evidence, and I was there watching, like you were, the slow speed chase and all the rest of it. But people just tolerate all kinds of things in our society. I'll come to a conclusion in a, a few more minutes and tell you the difference between tolerating it and doing something about it. But first of all, these nihilists would probably call George Washington and Sam Adams and Thomas Jefferson and James Monroe and all the rest of them bigots. They would call all of our presidents bigots. Theodore Roosevelt would be a bigot. Eisenhower would be a bigot. Let me give you a quote from General Eisenhower when he was our president. Quote, without God, there could be no American form of government nor an American way of life. Oh, I can just hear the shrieks and screams. What? What do you mean without God? Who are you? Some dumb general that just happened to be the supreme commander of over whatever, six million men during World War II that came back to the accolades of a grateful nation and became the president, one of our very finest presidents. And that is an absolute truth that he spoke. There could be no American way of life without God Almighty. He went on to say, recognition of the supreme being is the first, the most basic expression of Americanism. But there are lots of people, oh, there are millions of people who say it is un-American to even speak about God. It was un-American for right in the wake within days or a week or so of 9-11 for a fire department to display the flag on a fire truck because it may upset someone. To me, that is so unbelievable that I've got to say the people got brains that must be old grandma's applesauce. It, it, it just does not make any sense at all for someone to reason that way. You're in America. All right, let's just think, all right, you're not in America. You're in uh, Mozambique or you're in Brazil. You know the way their flag is, a kind of a green uh, diamond in the middle of it. Or you're in Germany. And if you go over there, even as a traveler and you're a tourist and a visitor, does it upset the daylights out of you to see the national flag of those people? Why should it upset an American to see the emblem of the country that gives him every privilege, every freedom, every blessing, every opportunity that he has? I'll never understand that. Now, nihilism is this. Happen to look it up, tell you about it. It is the entire rejection of the usual beliefs in religion, morals, government, and law. The denial of all existence, rejection of objective reality, or the possibility of an objective basis for morality. It means everything and anything goes and there is nothing that is absolute. These idiots who believe in that kind of garbage will tell you that the old statement, that which goes up must come down, is not necessarily so. Remember the old song, it ain't necessarily so? 
It's happened every time, hundreds of billions of times in the past, but that doesn't mean that it's likely to happen again the next time you throw something up. It could just keep going up. That is how stupid, dumb, idiotic they are. Some of those people may belong to the Flat Earth Society. I don't know. I don't even know if that exists anymore, but there used to be people within the last 20, 30 years who still thought the world was flat. The third meaning of nihilism is use of violent methods against a ruler because you see it devolves down into anarchy and not only a belief that religion, morals, government, and law don't mean anything and ought to be set aside, but the desire to do something about it. And so to tear down all the government, one, one thing that is wrong with people who do that, this is the fate of all of those who would destroy the status quo. They would bring down the government. They would destroy the government. They would destroy the system. They would tear down the laws. They would destroy them all. They would then become, listen, the proprietors of the new status quo. And it wouldn't be very long before the people who are existing under their imposition of whatever status quo they think is appropriate would begin the same tiresome old revolutionary attempt that fueled the revolution that they overthrew, you know, the government they overthrew. That just happens to be, you know, I said way back in the 1960s during the so-called hippie movement, if it was a movement, the long-haired guys in a little painted up VW vans, the pig farm up north of Albuquerque where the health department said that the kids refused to even take any kind of medicine and where all kinds of venereal diseases were rife and all of this type of thing. And the flower children, if you're going to San Francisco, be sure to wear a flower in your hair, blah, blah, blah. I said, the one thing that's going to happen to these people is that eventually they're going to grow up. I'm sorry, but it happened. It happened. Some of them actually ran for and were elected in government offices. Some of the people who were the most absolutely hedonistic, nihilistic, anti-government, anti-status quo, actually eventually became a part of the system and joined one of the political parties and got involved in politics. So it happened to them, and I'm so glad. Of course, a lot of people around don't think the hippie movement is over. There's still guys that like to wear their hair down here. Well, that's their problem. I'm intolerant of it uh, in one sense, but I'm tolerant of it in another sense because I don't do anything about it. Let me explain that to you right quickly. I am utterly intolerant of abortion, of the gay rights movement, of the idea that the gay partners of a couple of three people who were killed on 9-11, I think the co-pilot or the pilot, I forget which, of one of the aircraft, perhaps the one that crashed into the Pentagon, actually had a gay partner living somewhere nearby wherever they're based. And I think it was the former first lady and some other people who were actually lobbying to make sure that the, I've heard now in the last few days, it's about 1.6 million, I think it is, is going to go be apportioned out to every single one of the families, the victims who are alive, whose breadwinner was taken away from them as a result of 9-11. And they were lobbying that the homosexual partners of people should receive the very same consideration of an actual family. I disagree 100%, but I'm not going to do anything about it except say my opinion, and I'm free to do that. And the government gives me that right. The United States of America is a, a place of free speech and free assembly and free religion and so on, and so I can have my opinion, but I'm not going to do anything about it. I am utterly intolerant of murder. I'm intolerant of venereal disease. I'm intolerant of abortion. I'm intolerant of all the things that people do that are destroying their own lives. I'm intolerant toward mothers like Susan Smith that put the two little boys in the car and pushed it into the lake. I'm intolerant of the woman that drowned her five children. But I'm not going to do anything about it. Now, a church leader once said, and I quote exactly, the only place on earth today where the government of God is being administered is in God's church, end quote absolutely wrong, absolutely false. I absolutely reject that concept 100%. To administer God's law would mean you would have to carry out the punishments for sin. It would mean you're going back to the Mosaic time when someone in the community, because that was a theocracy, would break the Ten Commandments. They would be taken out and stoned to death. It says, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. 
And so all the people getting involved with Harry Potter would be in real trouble today if this were the laws of Moses being applied today. No, no, no. God Almighty right now today is as intolerant of sin as He ever was. But because we have rejected Him, He's gone way off and turned His back on us. Almighty God is not being involved on a day-to-day -day basis in our rotten society today with all of its sins and all of its faults and ills and immorality and hedonism and nihilism and anarchistic behavior on the part of individuals who know no bounds and no constraints and recognize no law, no morality. Almighty God just isn't doing anything about it right now. And that's exactly the way I am and that's exactly the way the organization that I head up is that people are absolutely against 100% some of these things that are so horrible in society around us. The very reasons why Almighty God oftentimes just does not give us the protection we wish we had. But they don't do anything about it except take a stand, except talk about it, preach about it, write about it. And if they are asked, explain why they're against it. But they never become violent. They never try to take the law into their own hands and do something about it. They let the powers that be take care of that. Well, I want to come back and close this in a few minutes, but I want you to be sure to get this information. Is God Tolerant? And the booklet, the best news you could ever hear. Take a look at this and I'll be right back. Our modern culture, reflected throughout the media, preaches tolerance. But are there any limits? And how tolerant is God? Call now for the free sermon tape entitled, Is God Tolerant? You'll also receive the best news you could ever hear. Both the booklet and this riveting sermon tape will be sent free if you call 903-561-7070. I've got to read to you what Newsweek magazine said about equating conservative Christians with the Taliban. They said, quote, our enemy in Afghanistan is religious extremism and intolerance. It is therefore more important than ever to honor the ideals of tolerance, religious, sexual, racial, reproductive, Sexual and reproductive means, of course, gay move movements and abortion at home. The GOP is out of the mainstream. Some Democrats will argue this year because it's too dependent upon an intolerant religious right. Certainty is the enemy of decency and humanity in people who are sure they are right, like Osama bin Laden and John Ashcroft, it went on to say. Oh, wow. You know, I think Ted Kennedy is a Democrat, isn't he? And isn't he a Catholic? What is the uh, Catholic Church view on abortion and all of that? I don't think that kind of a thing is going to go across very well in American politics. We'll wait and see because I think a lot of people are pretty desperate right now because of the all-time uh, incredible improvement uh, level of George Bush and the way he's handling the war as well as the domestic economy. Well, I've got to get off of here. It's about time to conclude, so I want you to be sure to get that one-hour sermon, Is God Tolerant? before a live audience just a few days ago. And also, here's the best news you could ever hear, free of charge and no price whatsoever, if you will dial 903-561-7070. That's 903-561-7070. Don't forget to look into our website, gtaea.org, and I'll see you right here, same time, same channel, in one week. Call now for the free sermon tape entitled, Is God Tolerant? You'll also receive the best news you could ever hear. Both the booklet and this riveting sermon tape will be sent free if you call 903-561-7070.